The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Listening to something you've never heard before can open the path to so many things. So tonight, on Canada's very first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, we hear from Charlotte Hamanick, part of the Juno-nominated Sila and Rise Ensemble, on their innovative musical voices. Then we return to a past conversation with author Bob Joseph on what people can do to help make reconciliation a reality. Also tonight, a feature interview with legendary Canadian musician and producer Daniel Lenoir about his life and legacy. It's Thursday, September 30th, and that's tonight on The Agenda. Throat singing is a traditional, deeply rooted cultural form. But for some young Inuit performers, it's also about getting people out onto the dance floor. With us now to explain in Iqaluit Nunavut, Charlotte Hamanik, one member of the ensemble, Sila and Rise, who have just released their newest record, Sila Jouak. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to have this conversation. Welcome to the show. So the new album comes out on October 29th. But you do have a new single coming out uh, tomorrow, October 1st, and the single is called Anilnik. Uh, we just wanted to share some of the music with the audience and then we can start chatting. Let's take a listen. It's hard not to bounce to that, and I saw you bouncing. <laughs> uh, so that's the new single, Anil Nelk, and it's coming out this Friday, October 1st. Um, what inspired this song? Well, all of our songs are very inspirational from our Inuit culture. Um, we have been recording in Ottawa and living away from our traditional Inuit homelands. We find ways to stay connected and through song, through dance, it's very much um, alive in us. And so all of our songs are very much inspired by Inuit culture, by Katajak, by our land, by the beautiful practice of Katajak, which is throat singing, um, being in tune with our bodies, with the land and with the environment. Well, you mentioned uh, throat singing. What is, this, what is the, uh, the significance of throat singing in Inuit culture? Katajak is extremely important to our culture, especially in these days, because we did go through a time where we were very much shamed by the Canadian government and by the churches for practicing parts of our culture. And so today it's important for us to reclaim parts of our culture that were nearly taken away from us. And it really does uh, connect us to mother nature, to animals, to the land. It connects us to our ancestors and uh, it just, it feels really good to sing and to keep this part of our culture alive. You said that it connects you to um, everything around you. How does it do that? Well, Sila is our environment. It's our natural habitat. Sila controls the world around us, our, the wind, the water, the skies, the animals. And so as Indigenous people, we're very much connected to these lands, to the ocean, to the ice. And so having these connections really helps to elevate us spiritually and just in those ways it's uh it's a beautiful way to stay connected and it's um when you talk about connection uh when it comes to throat singing um i don't know if i have this right but it, it did it originate as a way to compete with one other person it is a competition between two people it's very unique to inuit in canada traditionally done by women we are competing to see who can go the longest without laughing, coughing, running out of breath, 
or losing our pace and messing up. But there's other reasons to throat sing. It helps us to keep warm in those cold winter months in the Arctic. It really elevates our body temperature. We also carry our babies on our backs in what is called an amauti, a large pouch. And our babies are resting against our backs and they can feel the vibrations and it resonates with them when they can feel us breathing and singing and, you know, rocking. It's very reminiscent of lulling a child to sleep. Um, and it's also influential of spirits. When men were out hunting for long periods of time, women would go out by the ocean or go outside of their tents or their camps and they would sing in hopes of um, influencing spirits to bring luck to the men in the camp who were out hunting. Well, you mentioned that Sila, um, I hope I get the translation correct, that Sila basically means universe. The album is called Sila Jouak. So what does the second part mean? So Sila is the, uh, Sila is the environment around us. Sila is the weather. Um, Sila Jouak is universe. Hmm. So when you add the affix Jouak to Sila, it... Um, creates the meaning of the broader term of our environment extending out into the universe. And what's the story behind the name of the group Sila and Rise? So Sila is the Inuit portion of the group, the throat singers, and we, Cynthia Pitsulak and I created Sila. We started singing together about 17 years ago. And uh, last year, Charlotte Carlton joined the band. So the three of us are Sila. And Rise Ashen is our producer. He creates the music behind the throat singing. So together, we're Sila and Rise. Um, and, and your music is so uh, innovative in the sense that you're combining two different uh, uh, cultures. You also combine it with dance music. Um, where did that idea come from? Well, Rise Ashen approached Cynthia. They had worked together. This was about five or six years ago. He approached Cynthia and asked if she would like to collaborate on a project that he was working on doing, um, coming up with a set for a circumpolar Arctic dance party. And he wanted to have live music along with it. So uh, when he approached Cynthia, she asked me if I was interested in singing with her. And then, so we just, it's, it just really meshes together very well. Mm -hmm. And the way Rise produces the music and the, his ability to perform live with us um, just makes this very beautiful vibe, very energetic vibe where we can dance and we can collaborate together in a very fun and lighthearted way. Um, you know, because Drew, uh, throughout this pandemic, music, performing live music, is something that a, a lot of people have been missing out from. And as a performer, what has that been like for you not to be able to connect with the audiences in that way? We've been fortunate to have live concerts and been hired to provide pre-recorded shows for different organizations and companies. So we're very grateful for that as we were able to continue working. But you're right, not having an audience is very different. Trying to pump up, you know, the vibe in a video without having anybody to look at and looking at a lens is not the same. But um, we managed to create an album uh, with the time that we had um, during the pandemic. So we had some ups and some downs, but we made it through. How did you work with some of the ups and downs? Well, just not being able to mm -hmm. perform live in front of audiences and then just have the extra time to be more introspective, to be able to go inside and not be so distracted with, you know, a very busy world that's outside. We were able to do a lot of great creating. Uh, so much has happened in the past year or so. We talked about the pandemic and this past summer um, was for uh, a lot of the country, um, the news of the children in the unmarked graves at the residential schools was very jarring, but this was something within the communities that you all knew. Um, and I don't wanna put you on the spot because I know that today is already a very 
um, emotionally taxing day. Uh, did the events of the past uh, few months, the pandemic, what happened this past summer, did they influence the creative process of your new album in any way? Yeah, first, I just want to thank you for bringing that up and to bringing light to that with your platform. And I want to thank you for being gentle with me when we're speaking about this, because it is extremely hard. Today is the first National Truth and Reconciliation Day in Canada. Canada is apparently 150 something years old, but we're, we've been here for thousands of years. And um, yeah, this past year has been very eye-opening for much of Canada and the world. We really allowed ourselves to be more vulnerable with the creation of this album. Our album starts off with a song dedicated to the children who have suffered in residential schools. And we've really allowed ourselves to be, just be more vulnerable, emotional, and um, just really being more personal with our music. Um, even before the we started the taping, I asked you how to pronounce uh, some some of the things, uh, some of the places, and I felt you know I came here as a refugee and I've benefited so much from you know from Turtle Island and I feel like there's so much that uh, we all individually need to do. For me, is learning the languages, um, but. You know, when we talk about uh, reconciliation, we talk about truth and reconciliation. What does that look like for you? There's a lot that people can do to help Canada and Indigenous people reconcile from the past. I feel like that term is thrown around a lot without deep meaning resonating with individual people. My advice, if somebody is wondering how they can do their part, is you can learn about Canada pre-contact, learn about Indigenous people, our culture, our languages. I really appreciate you trying to pronounce our, the name of our, you know, album, the name of our songs, because this is one of the reasons why we're using Inuktitut so that people can try and be forced to pronounce the names of our songs and the names of our album. And understanding the beauty of this land and the indigenous people that have occupied this land for thousands of years and appreciate the stewards of this land. And then also understand that it's your responsibility to educate yourselves on the history of Canada so many times that responsibility lies on us to speak about our past, to speak about the history of Canada. And it's very, it can be very exhausting. It's not only up to us. There's the other side of Canada. There are the Canadians and the settlers, and it's your job to learn about the forced reconciliation, the forced relocation of Indigenous people, about the suicide epidemics that are happening, about the dog slaughters, the fact that we don't have clean drinking waters in our communities, that we are living with food insecurity. There's so many issues that Indigenous communities are faced with today. And we need our allies because the unfortunate fact is that white people are listened to and taken seriously compared to people of color trying to speak. And so we need our allies. We need people to speak up. We need people to listen to us and believe our stories. And listening to the album, it's uh, some of the songs that I've heard that you, um, you've created in the past. There's so much beauty in them. There's so much joy. And I know during um, these past few years, so much has been expected from the various uh, Indigenous communities where we're talking about pain and sorrow, but there's a lot of joy and beauty. Um, for you as a musician, uh, what kind of role do you think art can play in that? Well, our, you know, we've got one song, it's called Nutaganut, translates to For the Children. And 
we want to give space to those children whose lives were taken away and not give space to those serial abusers who took those lives and who abused those children and put those children back into Mother Earth. We want to give space to celebrate those children, to acknowledge those children and to help lift their spirits wherever they may be. And so art can be a very beautiful way to heal our communities and ourselves and to just give space to the what me, what deserves to be given space and not the monsters that created all of this trauma. Charlotte, thank you so much for your time. Um, uh, the new single is out, Anil Nick. It's coming out on October 1st. And Silajua comes out on October 29th. Thank you so much for your time. Hoyam Namik. It's been more than a decade since the launch of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and almost a quarter century since the report of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. Still, many Canadians, when it comes right down to it, aren't informed enough on the history or culture of Indigenous people to know what reconciliation is all about. Bob Joseph is founder of Indigenous Corporate Training, Inc. His first book was called 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act, and now he's published the sequel. It's called Indigenous Relations, Insights, Tips, and Suggestions to Make Reconciliation a Reality. And Bob Joyce joins us now for more. So nice to have you back in that chair. Thank you, my pleasure. I, I want to start by reading an excerpt from the book, and I kind of like the way you got into it, so here we go. You ready? I'm ready, I'm ready. You start by saying, thanks for picking up this book. Doing so shows that you are interested in joining so many others on the journey to reconciliation. The insights, tips, and suggestions included here are all practical and doable. We're sure you will have some aha moments as you read. You may even have some oh no moments that make you squirm. Don't feel bad. We're all on this learning journey together, and together we will make this world a better place. Gila Kasla, Bob Joseph, and your wife Cynthia F. Joseph, with whom you worked on the book. Uh, okay, just before we go any further, Gilakasla, what does that mean? Greetings. In what language? Kwakwala. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. and, I, you, and you did well, by the way. Just, thank you. Yes, you did very well. Thank you. That is, if I may say, a rather different way to open a book. Why did you choose to do that? Uh, I, you know what? I, I, I think that reconciliation requires us to just think differently. And so I'm always trying to see as many perspectives as I can, as well as share as many perspectives as, as I can as well. Why do you think it's so difficult for so many to discuss reconciliation? I think, you know, um, I think Canadians at some level feel a little bit of guilt and maybe some shame in behind some of the history. You know, they're only just learning about uh, residential schools and Indian hospitals. And, you know, we certainly still have uh, articles about drinking water and those kinds of things. And so I think it's, uh, it's an uncomfortable topic for people, so. You go through really quite significant chapter and verse. Actually, I should say, it's, you know what, what I told you this before we went on the air. It's a really good book, and it's, I don't know if you can see this here, it's fairly short. So it's, it is good, punchy, practical, doable advice, as you call it, mm -hmm. but you do go through chapter and verse of sort of the most common mistakes that non-Indigenous people make when trying to relate to Indigenous people. Go ahead, what's your favorite? Um, you know what, my favorite is people want to uh, really help. I, I get a sense that Canadians want to uh, engage and be involved in reconciliation, but they really just don't know how to start or what to do. And so their first sense, which I think is a totally Canadian value, is to say, hey, I'm here to help. Hmm. And, uh, and, I, and I always just tell people, that's great that you want to help. You please do. It's, it's very much needed. But, you know, when we look at Indian affairs for the last 130 years, that, that's what it was all based on. Hey, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people, if they come to me, Bob, I see the plight and I really want to help. I always say, yeah, just don't say that. It'll, make, <laughs> it'll, it'll bring back memories and do things that you don't want it to do. So I think that's a big thing. I think one of the big reveals for me in the book was the notion that... You know, if you were talking to people in the Jewish community, nobody would assume that they all had the same views or the same, you know, cultural approaches on everything, or the Italian community or the Greek community or whatever. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, we seem to think that when you say an indigenous person, regardless of what part of the country or what nation, etc., that it's somehow monocultural. Not the case, right? No, no, it's a really diverse country in terms of indigenous peoples. There's, uh, when we look at just First Nations, 11 
major language families, over 50 different dialects, or as different as Spanish is to Japanese. And then mm. you throw into that mix uh, Inuit and also Métis peoples. And mm. what you have is, uh, you know, if you were to look at a map of indigenous peoples in Canada, it'd be like looking at a map of Europe, you know, mm. just in terms of the culture and regional differences. And, and nobody expects Greek people and, and German people and French people to all have the same culture and speak the same language. But for some reason, we seem to think that's the case for indigenous people. Yeah, and I think, mm. you know, I think it was the Indian Act that really, you know, sort of homogenized everything. Mm. Yeah, they're Indian, so therefore they must all think alike. But they, they don't, they really, you can, I always tell people you can find three different views. They'll su be supportive of what you're talking about, they'll be against what you're talking about, or they won't really even be paying attention to what you're talking about. <laughs> what do you think non-Indigenous people know, need to know first and foremost about the treaties? Um, I think, you know, the treaties are a, a fundamental part of the relationship. There's historic treaties, which if you, you know, if you uh, downloaded Treaty 3 here in Northwest Ontario and, you know, printed it on eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper, it would be three pages with signatures and preamble and, and, you know, the text where, you know, if you looked at a modern treaty from British Columbia, the Niska Treaty, it's a 976 page legal document with the I's dotted and the T's crossed. So there can be, um, quite big differences, but they're um, important relationship documents for, for uh, Canadians and, and largely they were done in 1763 to um, solidify military and economic alliances by the British colonial government. So this is uh, 100 years and more before Canada was Canada. Yeah, yeah. King George recognized mm -hmm. all of the indigenous peoples that were here as nations of people. These are nations of people, so wherever we go, you know, New Market today or, you know, some other part of the country, wherever we go, if there's people there, they're a nation of people. And wherever there is, they actually own it and we have to buy it from them. So this royal proclamation really codified the relationship between today Canada and Indigenous peoples that said these are nations, they own land, we've got to buy it from them. And, and uh, it actually said we're not supposed to molest or disturb them in the possession of such parts of our dominions and territories. So honestly, I think, you know, if we think about the Star Trek franchise, if you remember the prime directive. Non-interference. Non-interference. I think, you know, maybe they got a little bit of help from the Royal Proclamation just in terms <laughs> of the, uh, you know, the, the relationship that is there, that exists. Now, there's also a chapter in here on what are, as you've described them, commonly, um, commonly held myths mm -hmm. that are not the case, but mm -hmm. which are widely held views. Mm -hmm. And I want to go through some of them with you right now, and I'll put I'll put to you what people, what many people believe, yes, and please. you can tell me what the problem is. Yes, yes. Okay, for example, and you've heard this no doubt, Indians already have ample reserve land and resources. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they, they don't really have enough lands and resources to be um, self-reliant. I think that's a key piece. There's a place for them to live, but in terms of that self-reliant, running their government, looking after their nations and their cultures, reserves just don't give them that opportunity. Um, if we remember back to uh, 21 Things, reserves were created as part of um, a post-Confederation assimilation policy. So we actually flip-flop on Indian policy in 1867. We decide they're going to assimilate. So we put them on these parcels of land called reserve lands. And they, they actually don't even own the the land that they live on that's mm -hmm. set aside for their use and benefit. It was a place where they were going to go until they assimilate. And so that's the, the big challenge. They don't own those reserve lands. They don't even own the houses. Uh, you can ask somebody that lives in a reserve house, do you own that house? Absolutely. It's mine. We've been here forever. But legally, technically, underneath it all is, uh, you know, Indian and Northern Affairs Canada. The title, it says, is vested in Her Majesty. So hmm. that creates all kinds of challenges for people living on reserve lands. And they are just, just for, uh, for people's reference. They are reserve lands in Canada. They're not reservations. Uh, that's really a U.S. expression, so I'm always trying to help people with sort of that piece. We only have uh, reservations at hotels, airlines, restaurants, and places like that. Now, if I remember the math, in fact, Indigenous people own, what, 0.2% of the land in this country? Yeah, it's not a very not a very big number um, mm -hmm. in terms of the percentage to land mass, yeah. And, and like I say, they, they don't even really own it. It's still, the title is still vested in Her Majesty. The idea was they were supposed to assimilate and then the federal crown would have lands that it could 
then decide what it wanted to do, uh, dispose of or otherwise. Okay, myth number two, Indians get free housing. Yeah, um, so the housing on reserve is um, complicated and each community will do it a little bit differently. Um, some communities, I can remember uh, talking to a former chief of the Wewakai Nation, um, won't build their members' houses. Uh, whatever you live in, Steve, that's up to you. We're going to spend the money that we do get to put down sidewalks and sewer and electricity and, and those kinds of things. We don't actually build our members' houses where other peoples may try experimenting with social housing where you can get a house and um, live in it as long as you pay $400 a month for X number of years. Mm -hmm. So it's not a rental payment because eventually it'll stop, but it's not a mortgage payment either. They don't, they don't own it when they're done. And so bands will do sort of different things to try and you know, increase the, the number of housing for people living on reserves. Myth number three, Indians don't pay taxes. Yeah, um, we have to be specific, and I think that's a, like a really specific myth in terms of Indians. So we, we walk down the street, we see indigenous peoples, and we assume that they all don't pay taxes. But if we were to think of uh, Métis peoples, they pay taxes, they have always paid taxes. Uh, Inuit people aren't covered under the Inuit Act, and so they're going to be in that tax-paying group of peoples. And, and then when we get to the actual Indian in the Constitution, Indian, Inuit, and Métis peoples, uh, it is only only the status Indians who are eligible for an income tax exemption underneath the Indian Act that's in a section called 87. Section 87 mm -hmm. was put into place to um, protect their property from the erosion of taxes while they were assimilating. So mm -hmm. if you're a status Indian working on a reserve and being paid on a reserve, those are Revenue Canada requirements, uh, then you can get your income tax exempt. You only need to meet two of the requirements, but certainly being a status Indian is one of them, and then where, where you work and where you're paid are the other two pieces. So. What, what percentage of Indigenous people in the country would meet those criteria? Uh, you know, I've, I've tried to uh, get the answer a few times, and uh, the, the problem with the answer is just um, um, that uh, Revenue Canada will send answers that include people who um, are um, employable, so personal income tax, they'll include numbers around income tax exemptions for goods and services delivered to reserves. And mm -hmm. So I'm always a little bit uh, confused when it, when it comes out, but I would have to say maybe in the 200,000 at, at the most, and to me that it's a really high number just in terms of when we look at reserves typically, um, really usually high levels of unemployment. So I'm not sure where those numbers are coming from. I'm a, I'm a status Indian um, here today, but where we are in downtown Toronto makes me, uh, this is taxable, taxable the next work guy. for me. Yeah, I got <laughs> I to gotta pay Uncle, can I, not Uncle Sam, not sorry, Uncle wrong Sam. government, wrong yeah. government, yes. Uh, okay, myth number four, Indians get free post-secondary education. Uh, there is post-secondary education dollars available through the federal government. It gets transferred to bands on a per capita basis. Your band has to have enough of a per capita to get funding transferred. But there's always a, a waiting list. Not everybody on that waiting list gets to go, I would say of the 100%, 80% probably wouldn't get any kind of funding from the band to go uh, to post-secondary education. Some bands will only pay the tuition and some will pay tuition and books and some will pay tuition books and um, living allowance of up to, I think, $600 a month to go and have a place to live while you're going to school. So. Bob, this is probably the most hurtful myth that uh, Indigenous people no doubt hear. Residential schools are ancient history, so why can't they just get over it? Yeah, very, um, it's, it's a tough one. You know, they are, they are uh, ancient history, but from the community's perspective, um, they're still healing from those residential schools. And actually, um, you have to also put it into a little bit of context. The last school closed in 1996. That's not so that ancient. I don't, I don't think so. No. Which means there's very young people who attended the schools who, you know, um, as people are probably starting to really see and learn now, those were horrible experiences um, in terms of uh, the abuse and all of the things that happened. Prime Minister uh, Harper noted in his apology, you know, the, the powerless people nature of uh, residential schools. So it is, um, I think, you know, it took us four generations to get into this mess. I don't think we're going to get out in, I hope it's not four, but I don't think we're going to get out in one. I, I, I was 
I was thinking that if, as long as we keep implementing the TRC recommendations, 15 years from now, this will be a completely different country. But anything less than that would be unrealistic. And as far as getting over it, I can remember uh, talking to a lady in one of our sessions, and I, I don't usually ask a question or, you know, to answer a question, but she said, you know, when, when will people get over it, Bob? And, and, uh, and, and I'd been talking to her on the break, and I'd asked her if she had kids, and it was just sort of a, you know, sort of a sociable conversation. And she said, so when do you think they'll get over it? And I said, I don't know, you've got kids. When would you be able to, to get over that yourself? Mm -hmm. And so it was sort of a, a question with a question, which I don't always like to do. But, but sometimes that's the most effective way to go. Yeah. Uh, we are down to our last minute and change here. So I want to do, let me just, let's finish up on some practical advice here. Yes. You do mention in the book, if you're going to have a meeting with indigenous people, for a business meeting, for example, be careful not to overdress. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you also say, don't keep looking at your watch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, let's get the explanation behind those two pieces of advice. How come? I, I like it. You know, um, the, the dress, and I really like your suit and tie. Just, I just want to throw that out there. And I like the fact that you're not wearing it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, uh, but I think, you know, in, in terms of that, that authority figure, remember it was the church, it was the state, it was the police who were taking away the kids. And those are very much um, authority figure issues that are created out of that. So if we show up with a really nice, you know, suit and tie, blue blazer, you know, then I think there's a chance there that we trigger authority figure issues. And so I, you know, just tell people if you want to, if you want, if you're going in to meet with the community, check out the website or their Facebook page, kind of take a look how everybody else is dressing. It's a little bit of uh, when in Rome, you know, mm -hmm. and we just, and for the most part, I tell people just to dress for the weather. And it's really because we don't want to trigger authority figure issues. And how that, about looking at the watch? Ah, the watch. So um, time is important. Indian time, is, you know, we, we hear that a lot. And, and, uh, Time is important, but it's not as important as having the right people there. So we, we won't, uh, you know, we wouldn't be upset if a meeting started late because Steve's not here. We've got to get Steve here first. That's, that's the time to start the meeting. And he could be coming by float plane or boat or some far off place to join the meeting. Um, in terms of looking at the watch, it's all about the uh, relationship. So if you're, you know, constantly looking at the watch, I got two more minutes and I know we're over time now, so. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Indigenous Relations is the name of the book, Insights, Tips, and Suggestions to Make Reconciliation a Reality. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Plenty of Canadian musicians connect with global audiences to great acclaim, but few reach as far into the sonic universe as Danielle Lenoir. His fingerprints are all over music you know and very likely love. From U2 to Bob Dylan, his work as a producer, composer, and on his own records puts Danielle Lenoir in a league of his own. With multiple Juno and Grammy Awards and a place in the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. He's got a new record out. It's called Heavy Sun. And we're pleased it brings him to our virtual studio from Toronto. It's such an honor to meet you. Enchante. Oh, thank you, Nam. Uh, thank you for taking the time to drag me out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, excellent. Uh, before we start chatting, I just wanted to play a short clip from the title track called Under the Heavy Sun. Sheldon, please roll. Okay. Tell you I know a place mm, The spirit rising from the ground Over there, they're singing in the night We're gonna, we're gonna shake them, shake them, shake them on down And you can call your friends Bob Marley once sang one good thing about music, when it hits, you feel no pain. And listening to this record, oh. it made me feel that way. Um, I really love the track, Tumbling Stone. Is that the feeling you wanted people to have from this record? Uh, I like the track Tumbling Stone because it suggests a journey and leaving one thing behind to find another. And I think uh, in these times, I've noticed that people are searching and that's okay, maybe it's always been the case, but uh, um, for anyone who's searching, they might find a little something uh, in the Heavy Sun record somewhere, and certainly in Tumbling Stone. And the organ in that uh, track, um, I know this is kind of like asking you to pick 
your favorite child, but is there one instrument that maybe conveys emotion better than others? Um, well, I find, I guess that's the job we have really, uh, is to find the emotion in, in an instrument, in, um, in an approach, because tools are easy to come by, you know, you can buy an organ, but you may not play it yet. So I think devotion uh, is a long journey, especially with a musical instrument. So I find emotion in the organ, um, if the right player sits at it. And I certainly find it in my steel guitar. I've been playing that since I was a child. So it, when it speaks to me, it, it speaks to me uh, on a level of emotion. So, um, there you go. And well, the song on the album has been described as having, um, it feels like it's taking you to church. Um, it has that feeling of not only community, but just the energy and the joy. Um, does that carry over to other songs on the album? Well, the, uh, <clears throat> the album has a lot of spirit in it. Uh, you know, when we released it, uh, somebody said, well, it, it feels as though it could be uh, in response to uh, being closed up by the uh, pandemic and had a sort of some kind of a key to joy in it. Um, but I think that that feeling largely comes from harmony singing because harmony singing suggests uh, cooperation and uh, uh, and being um, at one with your mates. And if we go beyond the quartet thing and we go to the community, it's nice to be aligned with our community. And so it, I think maybe that's where the spirit lives, is in, is in gathering and community. If you've ever been to um, parts of Africa, there, there's this great tree, the baobab tree, um, that is just, uh, it's magnificent, and it usually serves as a place for community. And you've said that this album was influenced by a thousand-year-old tree. In what ways? Uh, well, the, the thousand-year-old tree uh, lives in Tule, mm -hmm. which is in Mexico, and uh, I came upon it on an off chance when I was driving through Mexico some time back, and I um, I visited the thousand-year-old tree, and there were people under the tree, and they were some were having picnics, some were praying, some were just having a a moment of solitude. And I thought the tree was a great gathering place. Um, they weren't worshiping the tree. They were thanking the tree for uh, being stable for that much time. And I think the uh, we all need um, sanctuary somehow. Some people find it, you know, just having a moment alone, maybe doing a, some uh, visiting a mantra that would do it. Someone else exercises, someone else rides a bicycle and so on. So the, it's just a nice reminder about the sanctuary. And, um, and the tree of Tule had that in it for me. It was just a really lovely place of gathering. Well, I was going to just follow up on that because you said uh, the tree offered sanctuary. Does this record offer you sanctuary? Well, I made the record and uh, we always find um, we go into the depths of record making and you know uh, to go into the depths of harmony singing uh, i suppose the sanctuary in itself mm -hmm. um just to have an understanding of how the parts interlocked uh and and uh so you can't be thinking about yourself too much um you have to be thinking about the others and maybe that's the gift of it you know that it, it feels uh, selfless somehow well, you wear you wear many hats. You're a producer and you're a musician. Where do you feel most at home, uh, producing or as an artist? Well, there used to be a difference back in the day. You know, when I was a kid doing that, you know, you know I was either working for somebody else or I was writing a song of my own. But the more uh, in the modern world, the more we travel, uh, the more we find that it all bleeds together. We just came off the road. We did three lovely shows. We call it the St. Lawrence River <laughs> Tour. Um, we played Montreal, uh, Quebec City, and Trois-Rivières. And there was something really lovely about the uh, the power of those three shows and bringing people together. And we were able to take those recordings back to the studio here. And so if there's anything in there that I want to visit, then uh, it could become part of a record. So. Uh, I think uh, 
in modern times, everything's bleeding together. Mm. You can even have your own radio station. <laughs> <laughs> this, just, this is true. Um, it must have been. It must have been such an awesome experience to be able to share that music again with an audience. How did it feel? Well, we hadn't played a show in a while, a couple of years, and um, to be um, communicating to an audience really was there was something very special about it. And I'm glad you brought it up because it uh, it plays on our um, our skills or a talent to uh, to communicate, and we hear our music through the the ears of an audience, and we modify the show accordingly. You know, I might I might play my guitar a little longer than I would otherwise, and and I might they might egg me on if if I get a cheer from from one guitar passage, I'll play a second one, and so on. And so we we always leave ourselves a um, a window of improv within uh, an arrangement and a set. And sometimes someone will, will yell out a, um, a request and we'll fulfill that request because it, it gives us a chance to uh, to do something uh, that belongs to the you know to that very moment um, but it was nice to see people um, um, I'll say it one more time congregation never goes out of fashion it doesn't there's nothing like listening to music mm -hmm. live with an audience, with other people, um, even the sweat, the funny smells, I will never ever complain about that or the sticky floors. <laughs> I really just want to be around people and listening to music. Um, but uh, you just uh, celebrated uh, a, a birthday. You j you turned 70 years young. No, um, that's not true. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, I'm 52. <laughs> you look great for 45. Um, <laughs> happy belated <laughs> birthday. Um, but I wanted to go back a little bit. You know. How how did a kid from Hamilton end up on the world stage that you're on now? Um, well, I'm a French Canadian kid for starters, uh, but my mom relocated the family in Hamilton to Hamilton when I was about nine years old. Um, I just got very excited about music, and I I, I wasn't about to make a three pointer, so I thought, okay, let, let's I'll pursue the. Uh, what seems to be an inclination and a talent and um, I just never stopped and then I bumped into the recording medium and I got excited about that uh, I only ever stuck to my story and I kept getting better and better and and then uh, one day somebody called me a name hey you I said what I said you're a producer oh, okay that's what I am <laughs> I mean you're incredibly humble because once upon a time you and your brother were recording in the basement of your home um, you had all kinds of people come through that basement and you were a very young man at the time um, including uh, Rick James even came to Hamilton to record with you but yeah. um, you said something in a previous interview that I found so fascinating and I think I found it fascinating because I'm a mom of two small kids but your mom was very supportive and um, you said something about how she allowed you kind of like the freedom to uh, discover what it was that made you happy and uh, mm -hmm. I know your mom passed away last year our condolences um, yeah. mm -hmm. when you look back on your musical career what would you say has been the bravest thing that you have done to get you to the point where you are now well to be brave that's every day. Um, I mean, the to get up in the morning and maybe not feel too good and go in the studio, maybe it's not happening, but we stick to it and we're brave enough to wait for something to come by. Brave enough to hand the ball over to uh, Wayne Lorenz, who's sitting on the couch here. You know, uh, he's my co-producer and um, has a brilliant mind. And so I may not feel very good on one day and I'll talk to Wayne and he can he will explain the uh, the position that we have uh, and we, we're always an ownership of something mm -hmm. we're always an ownership of of an approach that belongs to us and we just need to be reminded that uh, the reset buttons are available to us so it's nice to have a friend to uh, to um, drag us through the um, the down times so but brave I don't think it's it lives out there somewhere. I think it lives inside, and it's every minute of the day you got to be brave. And music is something that 
helps people through those moments when you kind of just want to like sit on the couch, eat mm. those bonbons. Uh, and music <laughs> has a way of pulling you off that couch. You know, uh, growing up, who were your musical influences? I like the way you said bonbon. <laughs> That's actually pronounced bonbon. Bonbon. Well, <laughs> It's I have true. a Franglais accent. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the uh, moments of inspiration come all kind of ways, you know. Uh, uh, but I will tell you a secret: we we uh, we do keep some jelly beans on hand, and if I get a little depressed, I just go down and drop a few of those, and I come back in a good mood. Well, after you nice can give moment. me your address, and I can come by <laughs> get some. <laughs> um, but uh, inspiration comes all kind of ways. You know, sometimes I'll hear a piece of music, and I think, oh my goodness, I can't believe they did it quite that way. Um, whether it be something from the past or something brand new. Um, um, usually in an un unexpected way, is, uh, the way it happens for me, I'll go to the uh, the Thai restaurant across the street, and the girls are always blasting some kind of something or other uh, <laughs> off the stereo, things that I don't know anything about. I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. Let's go and do some of that. But um, I talk to friends, uh, and they're forever inspiring. I, I got a call from Neil Young on my birthday. It was lovely to hear his voice, and I thought about all of the lovely things we had done together, uh, his humor, his Canadian perspective, his commitment. I thought about a lot of things mm -hmm. just from one little phone call from an old friend. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, Well, you've said in a previous interview <laughs> that I saw that you said that uh, you get ideas all the time and sometimes it's a gift and a curse. Um, why is it a curse? Well, Ideas are only ideas until they get put into play. So the curse might be that we don't get around to doing something about every one of them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an inventor, you know. I I, I have beautiful ideas uh, that are have nothing to do with music, and but I don't have the time to do anything about them, you know. But I came up with one that I'll tell you about. Mm -hmm. We uh, job creation program that uh, also uh, is a nice contribution to inner peace. We do away with the backup beeper and. Uh, and now you have to have a person that replaces the beeper. A little bit like the cross guards, you know, when you come home to work, there's people helping kids cross. So this is the same cross guard gets a job riding shotgun, but they jump out and they direct traffic for the backing of a truck and no more beeping. Stop the beeping. No more beeping. <laughs> All that for beeping. <laughs> I love it. So. Oh my goodness, you know. The, you know the, if, if we, we ever can, wondered we could talk if we more. ever wondered why people are jumping off bridges it's because they're being tortured by beeps. With the beeps. <laughs> like sometimes in the middle of the night I actually wake up and I hear it in my head. Um but there's another mm -hmm. song on the album that I wanted to talk to you about. Um it's mm -hmm. called Power and that was apparently inspired by a message from your longtime collaborator Brian Eno um about the injustices occurring in Uganda, the country that I was born in. Um, and you and Brian first met in Hamilton. Um, why, what was it about your, I guess, your chemistry, your, um, the way you understood each other that, uh, um, that fostered this relationship? Well, uh, I appreciated that Brian Eno came in with a vision and he was going after something that he had put a lot of thought into. Um, but it was very, um, quite far out and let's say non-commercial uh, at that time and um, but we dove into uh, the processing of sound and it really opened up a lot of doors for me in my own mind you know if not business doors it opened up um, a way of looking at music and that was pretty much at uh, from that experience, I decided that I would always uh, work on things that I love the most. And uh, I mean, I, I came up poor, so we had to record a lot of things to make some cash to buy equipment and all that. I have no regrets about it, but I did reach that that crossroads where I thought, okay, from here on, I'm gonna stick with what I love the most. So, and I hope everybody has a chance to get there within their own commitments. <laughs> Do you think that, that you said something really interesting um, there? Because I grew up um, also poor, new immigrant to the country, and that shaped the way that I see the world. How do you think that, 
helped you see the world, especially after you reached such astronomical success? Um, well, when you, uh, when it's a realistic situation, you know, in my case, uh, you know, we didn't have a daddy around and my mom had four kids. She was pretty young. So um, I knew that I had to work or else, uh, you know, it wasn't just going to fall out of the sky. So it, it, it created, uh, it was definitely a real environment where I, I had to make a go of things. And, um, and I think that sets a standard, uh, you know, somebody might call it a, a work ethic and let it be. Um, but I think when you, uh, in my case, I learned very young that um, if I wasn't about to do it, if I didn't do it myself, then someone else was not going to do it for me. You have a new single out called Torn Again, and it's another project that you're working on. And this one, uh, it features a recording of Leonard Cohen reciting a poem. Um, I wanted yeah. to play a short clip for our viewers. Sheldon, please. All right. Thank you, Nan. You smile at your suffering, the sweetest reprieve. Why did you leave us? Why did you leave? You kick off your sandals and shake out your hair. It's torn where you're dancing. It's torn everywhere. When you're working with a voice as sacred as Leonard Cohen, um, because watching that and hearing his voice, it's just so, like, your whole body is present when you're watching and listening to that. How do you find the balance between keeping its authenticity, like Mr. Cohen's uh, voice, and then trying to do something different with it, as you've done here? Well, we had a job. Uh which was to frame Leonard's voice and his words and pay a compliment. Um, so we were, uh, but that's often the case with the center of any musical picture, be it a melody, uh, what is the center and how will you best compliment that? Mm -hmm. If you think of it as a, as a picture, then some things need to be in the shadows a little bit and there might be a moon in the distance and the foreground will be better for having a moon in the distance you don't want the moon right next to the front of the picture so it's we think of it we think in visual terms and um i suppose uh um that's where you know the power of instinct comes into play you know we 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 do what we can to complement the center of of the attraction mm -hmm. so and to have a chance to do that for Leonard was, was uh, c'était un grand plaisir, as they say in, in trois rivières. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I wanted to translate that, but my French is not that great. Uh, but it, uh, me, yeah, okay, well, you get no, the idea. No, what, I, I do get the idea. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to circle back to uh, how we started the conversation, and we were talking about how this new album uh, makes you feel as if you're in church. Um, and I'm curious, uh, what role does religion play in your music? I don't think religion plays much of a role in my music now. Um, I grew up Catholic and I served at the altar, and so I have that in my past. Um, but we try and uh, raise the spirit if we can. And um, my latest slogan is we try and wake up something inside a listener that uh, it might be dormant in there, but we have a responsibility to push that little button that may make someone want to be a better person or think a certain way and I think that's the job of art it shouldn't be we shouldn't be in awe of art we should be in awe of its effect and you've worked with so many different artists like B Peter Gabriel U2 Bob Dylan Emmy Lou Harris the Neville Brothers mm -hmm. Willie Nelson the list goes on and on and on um, and I'm curious what does uh, a collaboration with you look like do you just pick up the phone and call Bono and say you know uh, I want to do something next Thursday Oh, no, no. I called Bono, who's my agent. I say, can you hook me up with Dylan? And he did. <laughs> um, no, I, I've never been good at, at uh, hustling for work. Um, the, uh, the work itself has, has uh, opened the doors, you know, and, and, and it speaks louder than me. Um, so if you, if you manage to do a something good along the way and somebody hears it, and then you might get a phone call. So that's pretty much been the process. Um, we know uh, we live in a time and day where people are thinking about 
the legacy that they've created, the work that they've done, and I know it's uh, the work you've done is very important. And from all the things that I've read about people who've worked with you, they've always said stand, that you're a stand-up individual. Um, you're not only talented, but you're a good person. What do you see your legacy as being? Um, well, the more we do this, the more we think about, uh, you know, the effect of, uh, that the music might live on. Is, is a nice way to look at it. Uh, if you can keep touching hearts with something that you put a lot of work into, then I think that's probably a good job done. Um, legacy, well, what I said a minute ago still applies. If we try and, and push that button, that might cause someone to change a little something about them how they see life or look at themselves. So that's it, we, we, we're waker uppers. We try and wake up something inside a listener. Hmm. Well, this has been absolutely like a highlight for me. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Colin Kish, uh, who was our editor for this show. And he's a big fan. And I was joking okay. with him that he should have done the interview, but I just wanted you to know how much Colin appreciates your work yeah. and how much we all appreciate your work. And as I showed you before, when we were off camera, the legacy, this is, you know, my high school yeah. soundtrack. <laughs> so thank you very well, much. Uh, well, you've heard of the NAM show. <laughs> well, now I have, yes. <laughs> the, Na the NAM show is, is a big, uh, you know, electronic show and it's very, very, it shows up in LA all over the world, so. I had no idea. Now we're on the real NAM show. Very nice to meet you, NAM. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much and continued success. That is the agenda for Thursday, September 30th, 2021. The Polaris Music Prize was awarded this week, and tomorrow we'll meet the artist who won, Cadence Weapon, and find out about his music and politics. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. And we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.